not only for their rights, but also for peace. And uh, they they gathered there in La Haya to design. May, may I ask again? May I ask again? You for you to mute uh, yourselves. Okay, thank you. So they uh, they gather to design a strategy of peace and protest against the horrors of war. And many women from many countries, as I, I said before, gathered, but they many of them had difficulties. In fact, for example, from France, not one woman was able to come. Women from Britain, they were held at the borders. They couldn't come. Only British women who were in La Haya uh, already could attend. So what I want to come here, um, call your attention to is, it's impactful to think that during uh, wartime, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, those women were able to travel from their countries with many difficulties to gather in La Haya. So it was an immense work they did. And uh, after the Congress, two delegations were put together and they traveled in Europe visiting leaders in 14 capitals. They visited prime ministers, ministers of foreign affairs. They visited the King of Norway, the Pope, the president of the USA and others. So they proposed to all those people, they visited the creation of a mediation team formed to be formed by prestigious people like economists, intellectuals, etc. But the neutral nations that were supposed to organize this meeting never did. And so uh, they were not successful in their uh, effort. And from their own, they even started to suffer persecution because as they were defending peace, it was very difficult to defend peace when their countries were in war. And after the war finished, the second International Congress with Women for Peace took place in Zurich in 1919. But now it was under a more pessimistic atmosphere of rebuilding of society. So from here, this was my introduction. I wanted to, to share with you, can you see this? Oh, no, 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 sorry. You cannot see it. Enrique, can you help me? Oh, yes, now. Can you see this? Miti, can you? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Okay. So, Women in Peace Negotiations, Resolution 1325. I wanted just to uh, share with you how much women had been working uh, previously. And uh, despite their, their efforts, the peace work done by women has, has or had at that time, maybe uh, these days it's a bit different, little correlation at decision-making decision level. Women's protagon protagonism in civil organizations is not easily transferred to the negotiation tables. And there are some types of resistances to women's participation. Status quo inertia, women are used to be out of the public game. Women themselves who don't want to sit with leaders who are criminals. The idea that the conflict inside are the ones to solve the conflict. Normally the conflicts are started by men and so they don't think women are relevant there. And a few arguments to defend women's participation in peace processes. Equity, the right women have to participate, which still needs to be reaffirmed because there are still many cultures that resist to recognize this right. And the idea that women take to the negotiations, topics and we issues no other actors bring up, such as education, health, family, reconciliation, and so on. Um, according to Luz Mendes, Luz Mendes, 
was the president of the consulting committee of Women National Union in Guatemala, um, she said, it is essential to articulate agendas with consensus and to have social and political power that back them. So women cannot just come to the to the negotiation tables. They have to they have to design uh, an agenda uh, program, and uh, this needs to be backed up by social and political power. Um, some other essential arguments in favor of women's participation, and this is very important here. I'm missing something here. I don't know why. Well, peace is a process that belongs to the communities and not only to the men leaders. So this is quite important. The whole community is to get involved in three main tasks to be dealt with after an armed conflict. For example, reintegration of soldiers, rebuilding of society, reconciliation between, between factions. Also, and other points to take into consideration uh, in order to build peace is that it's necessary to come to agreements for the sharing of power, agreements for the reconstruction of the economy, agreements for dismobilization and reintegration of soldiers, legislation about human rights, legislation to regulate access to land, legislation to regulate access to education and health assistance, legislation about the status of displaced people. So many things need to be taken care and uh, agreed upon. So the community, again, I would like to emphasize this, is the one that's going to rebuild life together. And women, of course, play a very important role in this aspect. Uh, here, I just wanted to, to give the example of women of Bat Shalom when they saw the situation getting worse in, between Israel and Palestine. They, uh, they um, published in some newspapers a declaration. And in this declaration, one of the, the sentences would say, before it's too late, let women speak and act. And this is not just let women come into the scenery. No, it's not like that. It's we need, we want to offer a new paradigm of um, conflict resolution, of uh, being able to offer a new style at the time of uh, discussing the, the problems. Okay, and now we come to the resolution itself. For the first time in 50 years, in October 2000, so last October, we celebrated 22 uh, years of existence. The Security Council debated the resolution 1325, which urged the Secretary General, the member states, and the humanitarian, civil, and military organizations to act in order to expand women's participation in peace processes and post-conflict rebuilding. They were to engage in actions in the following areas. Enhance women's participation in peace processes and decision-making, training for the maintenance of peace according to gender perspective, protection of women during armed conflicts and in post-conflict situations, transversal introduction of gender in the data collection and in the information system of gender, sorry, in the data collection and in the information system of the UN. The Security Council recognized in this resolution that peace is inextricably united to equality between men and women, and that women's participation in the power structures and their implication in the efforts for prevention and resolution of conflicts is essential for maintenance and promotion of peace and security. This step is historical because it follows the tradition of one of the greatest civilizing efforts in the last century. And this is the organization of the first International Congress of Women's for Peace in La Haya. That was a, a, an immense effort at the time of war. And uh, so uh, 
that's you know the foundation let's say uh, so for more than a hundred years women have had it clear that in order to participate in decision making about war and peace they had to unite so this effort has been going on even before the end of the 19th century so the resolution 1325 was the result of women working together of the international and transnational efforts and alliances built by women's organizations and nets. The international community step by step has opened the way for women's participation in the political system till today. It was a slow process which got a push due to the work of NGOs and people in relevant positions in the international organizations. In fact, one uh, woman uh, related to the Security Council said that it's very important that organizations at ground level communicate intensely with women at high level, level positions and look for those women who want to push hard the agenda of equality uh, of women and men. The High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN Sergio, this is a Brazilian man, Sergio Vieira Melo, who was killed in Iraq in 2003, said, in East Timor, I could see the impact that women's participation can have in peace building and development. Women are a factor of stability and reconciliation. Their contribution can improve the quality of the decisions and therefore the effectiveness of the efforts for recovery. Especially, we promote women's participation because they have the same right as men to participate in decision making because their contribution is an added value in all decisions. So, I would like to uh, give you two examples of two initiatives that were immediately taken after the resolution 1325 was approved. And uh, before it was approved, a group of organizations got together and created the task force about women, peace and security. And they were the ones to push hard for the approval of the resolution 1325. Their thesis, I mean, oh, sorry. Their thesis was that gender inequality is a threat to global peace and security. And to confront this threat, they proposed prevention of conflict, participation of women in peace and security issues, and protection of civilians, giving specific attention to women and men's needs. Actually, I have copied this sentence from, uh, from the material I have been reading. And I was thinking, who else? I mean, giving specific attention to women and men's needs. I mean, the, those are the ones we have to take care, actually. So the resolution was approved and then the task force, once it pushed for, the, for its approval, was to spread it and push for its application. And so there are two initiatives here that I would like to, to give as an example. Um, one was the Security Council of Women, a net created in Germany by 50 activists for peace, researchers and NGOs. They influenced and followed the activities of the German government for two years to check if they were incorporating the gender perspective in foreign affairs, affair politics, and in their security agenda of the country. One uh, initiative they had was to organize a campaign of sending postcards to the German government saying 1325 reasons to support the resolution. Um, so the most important demand of their action was to obtain a bigger representation of women in the regional, national and international institutions and agencies for prevention and resolution of conflict. I will just mention that they want a quota of 30% of women in peace processes and in all institutions that work to implement peace treaties. Uh, the second example I would like to give you is an initiative taken by the Women's Federation of Universities of Canada. Uh, from the beginning, they pressured their government to support the resolution with allocation of funds for their activities, both in Canada and abroad. 
They searched for opportunities to incorporate women's voices in conflict resolution processes, in prevention and in the way out of a conflict, in humanitarian assistance and rebuilding processes. They also urged the government to work for the protection of women in face of gender violence, in particular rape and sex harassment. They also required the representation of women in governmental institutions at a 50%. To follow up on this, the Canadian Federation asked the government to facilitate regular reports about the number of women's groups they were being cons that were being consulted by them. And uh, I'm about to finish. I just want to bring curious facts about the Resolution 1325. It's the only resolution by the Security Council that is celebrated since its approval. I think Caroline here can tell us if this is true or not. And if it is, if you have participated in their initiatives, I think they promote an open debate and inviting members and non-members, non-member states, representatives of NGOs uh, at the UN and regional um, um, and regional organizations to discuss how much the uh, resolution is being implemented. Also, another fact is that in the third anniversary, anniversary the Subsecretary General of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations explained the concrete steps taken in the operations for peace in Sierra Leone, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kosovo, East Timor, and Afghanistan. And, uh, I think it has been translated into more than 80 languages, over 80 languages. Um, the Secretary General has appointed several women over the years to lead observation mission operations. I have the names of two of them here, Heidi Tagliavini in Georgia and Caroline Makaski in Burundi and many others. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And um, at this point, I would like to invite Caroline, who has been working closely with uh, women's organizations at the UN and has had several interesting experiences, many experiences related to Resolution 1325. So the floor is yours, Caroline. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia, for that. Uh, yeah, I'm not muted. Huh? for that presentation. Um, many, many interesting points. Actually, I didn't know you were going into that. Oh, kind of a wide perspective over, about, about this. Time can shift, yes. Yeah. Is somebody... Can you please mute yourself? Yeah, please. Um, uh, you know, it's it's amazing. We have 84, 84 people yes. on this call. Yes. I mean, that shows what? That shows I, something. I'm going to stop. So oh, yeah, maybe stop sharing, huh? right? Because I don't, I may share something, but uh, yeah, but it's nice to see everyone's faces. Huh? So really, thank you all for joining. It's really, um, I mean, that we have this interest in this resolution. I would uh, love, I think, I wish we had longer because I would really love to hear from you, first of all, you know, why, why is it important actually? Why is it important that the United Nations writes down that the, the world leaders come together and decide to include women in peace negotiations to, to tell us that we are, you know, we, we, we are deserving of being there when these peace processes are being worked out. I mean, I think we know that, don't we? we, we I always felt that way. Even in 2000, when this, when this was uh, when this was this resolution was passed, I remember very very well following this. And um, but I remember just sort of like scratching my head and thinking, what? Well, why do we really? Why do we have to have the governments tell us that we are we should be in peace processes? Of course, we should be in peace processes. But then uh, since then, also I thought a lot about what difference that actually does make when an author authority, global authorities, you know, decide, and I tell you, it was not an easy process. It was not an easy process for this group from uh, Women, Peace and Security. It was, it was a, 
I don't know if it was a committee or a task force or working group, I don't remember anymore, but, but this, uh, this group of very strong-willed women, I think they were all women, and they were really lobbying for this with the uh, president of the general of the Security Council at that time. And uh, actually, in fact, the, the one who really helped to open the door the widest uh, was a, a dear friend of Women's Federation, and that is Ambassador Anwalu Chowdhury from Bangladesh, who was president of the Security Council and who's come actually to many of our conferences and really, you know, we've given him awards and things. He's really a, a great, great man who loves working with civil society and who really values women's uh, contribution very sincerely and very much. So I wonder if you don't mind, I, I thought if we can just take a moment to maybe, Marsha, you referred to it, but maybe just to take a moment to, um, let's see, I have to see what one it is on. It's my, it's, okay, it's my Google. Um, yeah, there it is. I just thought it's it's always inspiring actually just to read a little bit of the wording of it actually, because you can feel how much went into this, the creation of this. I'm sure many, if not all of you are familiar. Uh, even look at this adopt, can you see this? Resolution 1325, you see that on your screen, right? Uh, yes. Do you see uh -huh. that? Is it big enough to see? Uh, it would be nicer if you could make it bigger. Bigger, okay. Okay, I'll make it 200%. Okay, how's that? Better. Yeah. So, I, of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I think it's about five pages. But, but uh, you know, first of all, in the UN, or when they make these intergovernmental kind of uh, resolutions and declarations, there's this all this very formal aspect that's leading up to it, you know, what happened in the past, you know, that this is building on like the Beijing Declaration and, you know, many, many different things about the whole history of Women's Day and women's rights and remembering about the principles of the UN Charter. And um, yeah, anyway, it goes, but then it comes to the point of um, reaffirming the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts and in peace building and stressing the importance of their equal participation and full involvement in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security, and especially to increase the need to increase their role in decision making, especially with regard to conflict prevention and resolution. So I just wanted to ask you, why do you think when this Security Council is a body that is, it's a legally, it's a body that has a legal backing it's not like just a declaration. Actually, it's something the governments who adhere to this, they have to even, in fact, at the very end of this uh, resolution, it says to that the uh, secretary general should remain seized of this document. That means it has to be coming up again and again all the time. And actually the governments have to report back the kind of um, uh, efforts that they are making. And if, you know, in, as they're reporting to each other, they're comparing who's doing more than the other. And of course they stimulate each other very much, but why, maybe I could just ask a couple of, one or two people, why do you think, um, sorry. No, I will go back to that actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, why do you think it is important that there is this kind of decision among government leaders for us. Why is it important for us to have that? How does that help us actually in anything? I mean, of course, in conflict areas, maybe you could see even more, but even say in Switzerland or UK or Spain, why is it important for us to have this decision and be able to refer back to this decision. Does anybody want to maybe say something? I can't see everyone because I'm I, sharing. But I would like to say something about Maybe, this. Marcia, maybe someone else who, who hasn't. Oh, you can okay. come back to you maybe after. But okay. is there anyone, anyone else in the audience that would like to say something about that? 
why do we need that? What, what difference does that make really for, for us, for our lives? Well, a couple it's, of it's a platform that we can use. Yes. And uh, so if they are not keeping or not doing what they promise to do or they want to do, then we can always refer to this and it's very powerful and also for governments and so on. And uh, I think it's it's very good to have something written. And uh, if they affirm it, then uh, yeah, we have uh, from this document, you have power. Uh-huh. Okay, anyone else? I, I just maybe speak out because I can't see you actually, or unless Mitty, you see hands raised or something, or Marsha. No, I cannot see anybody. I can't see anyone, okay. Mm -hmm. Because, because that's important. I can see very much looking back 22 years ago, things have changed so much for yeah. women, actually. Yeah. I'm not going to just say it's just because of Security Council Resolution 1325, but there are many other different things going on, you know, in the global kind of uh, debates. There are There is, of course, CEDAW this convention on the elimination of discrimination against women. There, there are many, many different things that actually started, I would say started accelerating because the other thing within the United Nations and among governments is they always refer back to something else because this was said, this can be a good thing or it can be, it can go in a bad way too, actually we, we see at this time, but it can be a good thing when this something like this Security Council Resolution 1325 is ratified, and then you have to go, then going on to the next step, you refer back to say, well, because this was ratified, then, uh, okay, in this particular peace negotiation in uh, somewhere in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the women there can, when they see that they are not involved or not invited, they can, you know, go to their governments. They can go and they can, they can, they can sort of make that complaint. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, that doesn't always solve everything either. And that's why, even in my experience, I saw that women from some, in particular, some of these areas <laughs> in Africa, because they tried that towards their governments and it didn't really work. But so they took their claim, their, their, you know, their complaint. Uh, they brought it to Geneva, actually, and they came to the Human Rights Council, and they started making statements about this demand that they had to be included in the public fora with all the governments listening. In this case, it was the Human Rights Council, which can be Security Council or whatever, or in, in um, uh, you know, any of these different arenas. But the point is that it, it, um, it kind of, it, there's a certain, it, it, some, it, it magnifies actually very quickly because we, we ourselves become more, um, we become more confident actually. Yeah, and I can see that even, even well, actually what I wanted to say before was really 20, 22 years ago when issues related to women came up in the Human Rights Council, this is my experience, you could see visibly people left the room, like it was just not very important. It, I was so shocked at first, then I was so sad, and I was so, <laughs> then I was, you know, but uh, the, the point is that then you couldn't do anything about it maybe at the early times, but then what, what would happen would be maybe, you know, that would be happening, and I'm sure not only at the Human Rights Council, uh, but then, you know, there, there becomes some kind of a standard that is set and when there is this Security Council Re Resolution 1325, or even the CEDAW protocols, uh, you can you can you can you know you can make your complaint or you can say something. You you can you can make it understood that this is not correct because the standard, this intergovernmental standard, says that it is not correct. So it's not an, what I want to say. It's not enough just to have. It's not enough just to have the documents. We have to understand the documents and we have to use those documents. We have to not just think that that's great that they say that, that the government say that about us, but actually we have to really find ways to apply that and even refer back to that because it also has to do with our own, it actually has to do with our own self-esteem. 
has to, and you know, at that time also, there were no statistics. There were no statistics about actually what difference do, does it make if women are there? We might see, you know, in our case, maybe we think like in the family, you have this, this little mini, you know, cosmos, and you have, of course, if the mother is not there, uh, this makes a big difference. The mother can prevent lots of conflict within her family or, you know, even in the community. But on this larger scale, because it just wasn't, there weren't statistics. And so it was sort of easier to get out of applying this. But now, because of documents like this, uh, groups can get funding. UN Women came on the stage since then. UN Women has done many, you know, now they have many, many statistics. Um, even I just wanted to refer to one. Um, yeah, here. Can you see that now did it change? Women's participation, do you see that? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is just, just it, this kind of thing would not be on the internet if, you know, if Security Council Resolution 1325 didn't happen, that people become seized with this, you know, they wanna prove this, they wanna show this, they wanna, they can get funding for it. They bring in interns to work on all this and bring the statistics. So even a simple thing, I have heard this quoted so many times and myself, I have quoted it many times. Just this, uh, on the average 13% of negotiators, 6% of mediators, 6% of signatories in major peace processes around the world. That's That was the average for women, but then since, uh, you know, in the in the more recent years, they the, they have statistics explaining that actually when women are part of peace processes, according to their statistics, um, uh, the, the 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 peace process is has the, has the potential to last like three times longer or something like this. I don't have these exact statistics with me right here in front of me, but there are very clear statistics out that are based upon lots of information that came in because there was funding and money and institutions to go out and find this information. And then what I would say is that over time is it becomes, you know, actually when women's issues come up in the Human Rights Council these days, I would say, the play, it becomes more full. The room becomes fuller than than for uh, some other things, you know. So it, it, this process, I would say, even just over 20, 22 years, there has been an incredible change of consciousness related to these things coming from the top down, which would be like the Security Council Resolution 1325, but also liberating women from the bottom up so that they, you know, they, they try. They, they push themselves into these negotiations. They feel empowered to say, no, we, 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 we belong here. Actually, if we aren't here, it's not going to work. We have to bring in all these issues, you know, uh, related not only to the broader, broad governance, but even the many issues that women tend to be more concerned about related to the future, future of the children, social systems, education, many of these things that the warlords who are usually in the, were in the peace processes in the past, they brought the same people to be the leaders in the negotiation who were the ones who were making the wars actually. That was, it just seemed like so uh, nonsensical. But in fact, once it started being analyzed and women did that, then it became, you know, it became clear and things, just on the in this area became more and more clear. So, um, yeah. So, is there a question somewhere or a comment that anyone wants to wants to make? I think from from this point, the point I would next want to to make, and we we don't have so much time, but I would say, you know, because I also wanted to show you quickly. Uh, okay, that's the resolution. Yeah. You know, it talks about like, um, you know, how, how peacekeeping, for instance, peacekeeping operations or uh, uh, the impact of armed conflict on women. In the past, we know 
women were being used as a weapon of war, women were being raped as a weapon of war, and it was just, there was actually no sort of coverage to prove that a crime, even though it's clear to anyone who has any conscience that that is a terrible crime. But the fact of these things being put in writing that can be studied and referred to and, and even that governments are held accountable to, then it, start, it, it doesn't make an immediate impact, but over time, it makes a huge impact actually. So the first whole part of this resolution is kind of explaining the history, then the importance of it, and a little bit the definition of it. But then down here, it, it talks about what is expected then from the member states. The member states should have increased representation of women at all decision-making levels. So this is even, of course, it was, it was talking about, especially in terms of peacekeeping and security and this area. But in fact, that was just like a wedge. That was something that was so outrageous that women could be, rape could be used as a weapon of war and things like that, that it was a kind of a wedge that could get, get us in, I would say. But it didn't really stop with just saying we're important, of course, for peacekeeping. Of course, we are important everywhere in every aspect of decision making. So from that point, it just, you know, it just, I would say it just expanded incredibly in this, yeah. in this short amount of time. Things like here, look, secretary or urges secretary general to appoint more women. I'm sorry, but these things weren't said before this. So security, uh, and then anyway, it's filled with many, many things like this. Some were done seriously and rather quickly. Some were forgotten about, but then, and this is this would be my final my point that I wanted to make was be would be then that's what what is our responsibility in this? It's not just again not just about Security Council Resolution thirteen twenty five, but it's about it's about CEDAW, the CEDAW Convention. Uh, just uh, two days ago, I met with a CEDAW committee member. Maybe maybe I'll just open that quickly so you can see what I'm talking about. Huh? This is the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And I would say, please, for those of you who don't know, again, maybe some of you know this better than me, but I would say if, if you don't know, it's good. It's good to just look at these things, just look at these things in the internet because you get so many ideas and uh, so much, uh, you know, maybe even reading it once, you won't see exactly what you can do about it. But I guarantee if you read it a few times and you discuss these things, you will find things that could be done. So this is a committee I met just last Friday. I ran into, oh, actually literally ran into a uh, vice president of the CEDAW committee, who I was, I was there with a group of young people attending the Human Rights Council social forum. And I started telling her about what we were doing with these young women, bringing in these young women and men, actually would bring men in too, young men. And, um, and she was telling me, you know, and giving them this experience at the UM, UN, at the social forum, they, these young people even had a chance to make statements, you know, to the, to the, to the forum, like ambassadors and experts. And, um, and I was telling her, I was telling this uh, CEDAW committee member about this. She's French. She was a former government minister, actually. She's very well known. And um, so I was telling her about this program that we have and this young women that we bring in. And she was telling, she told me that they are so, CEDAW is so um, desperate to have more input from civil society because CEDAW is also something that is legally binding. This is something that governments have to make reports periodically about how they are doing in, you know, in adhering to these different um, protocols that are that are agreed to through the CEDAW committee. And so periodically governments come in and they, you know, they make their reports. So oh, like we're doing so great, we're doing everything well. I mean, they don't <laughs> do that, but some do. And then what should happen is that uh, the um, civil society, national human rights institutions also, but also civil society should be in there in equal force, giving their report from their point of view, how actually is this government doing on these areas of elimination of discrimination against women? And maybe just to, to um, I hope you don't mind, I'm jumping to this from the, from the 
Security Council resolution. But uh, for instance, CEDAW, it's just to, to read this, CEDAW Treaty is a tool that helps women around the world to bring about change in their daily lives. Uh, in countries that have ratified the treaty, CEDAW has proven invaluable in opposing the effects of discrimination, which include violence, poverty, lack of legal protection, denial of inheritance, property rights, access to credit. So it, it's really, it's not just peace and security, it's actually everyday life. And the point is this, this committee member was telling me what they're looking at right now is kind of a, a theme that they're looking at is this, this uh, um, how to help women locally at grassroots level to really have this kind of mindset of leader, how to really like empower women to leadership. And she was so, I felt so moved to see this kind of program that we had where we were bringing these young people from four different continents in and giving them this experience at the UN to practice leadership. So she invited me actually to speak at the CEDAW committee that comes up in March about this topic, which is quite, it is amazing thing actually. And I have to take seriously my preparations there. But, um, but coming back to us, I would say, you know, whatever, whoever you are representing or even just rep representing yourself, but maybe better to do it in groups, Women's Federation, I see some people that on the line that surely are not within our Women's Federation, but this whole civic consciousness, this consciousness to try to engage with our governments to improve the status quo. You're muted, Carolyn. Oh, back, back, you know, going back to this Security Council resolution again, there are so many opportunities for us to, to do something that can actually affect the decision making of our governments and help our governments to become better. And the other thing that was said by another, another CEDAW president to me one time, who spoke at one of our events, she was a, a she is an Egyptian, Nayla Gaber. She Zoe knows her. Uh, she's been CEDAW president a few times. She keeps coming back. But she said, she said in one meeting that please, to civil society, she was saying, please don't just come here to complain. We need to work with people who want to work together with us. You can you can disagree. You can you can see that your government is doing something that they shouldn't do, but don't just take our time, uh, you know, to complain about what is wrong. But really think how can you help us to do better? So we within my NGO committee on the status of women that I am president of at, in Geneva, uh, we just had a meeting today on this. We are going to really try from our constituencies to bring some of our members because we have many, we have all the major uh, uh, NGOs, you know, international MGO, NGOs who are members of that committee. And we'll try to bring in, also invite some of you to some, sort of learn and have some training. This, this, this woman, this, this CEDAW committee member currently wants to make a little training half day with us to really help us to understand how we can participate in this and really multiply the impact of our work. Because I think so many of us, it's just governments can't possibly see things the same way we do. And we have a hard time seeing things the way governments do, but that is the other secret. And that is what this whole event was like for when we brought these young women last week. We tried to train them to think, to look, to think we don't come in just as NGOs. We have to really think, like when you make a speech, you have to think who you're talking to. So if we want to make an impact with governments and international bodies, we have to know, well, knowing their language is important, but you can sort of get around that. But you have to know some of these documents. You have to understand why they made these decisions to, to write these things down and to claim these things. And then thinking along with them, we can help to improve them. And um, so maybe I won't Carolyn, go further, but... Um, Caroline, I think uh, 
we it's 20 it's 9 27 yeah and we have uh 20 uh, three minutes actually three minutes to finish our um presentation and i was wondering if there is i mean we may have time just for one comment or question um about the the topic today if there is anyone who would like to to say something and uh I like to say something very important and I like everyone to listen carefully. You say, Caroline, say thank you very much for Caroline. Thank you very much, Marcia. And the big thanks for Mitty to allow us to listen for this important uh, election or whatever. We need to do not saying things. We need to train more young women some of you, you know me, some of you, you don't know me. My name is Nida and I am political economy advisor and peace and uh, peace um, and uh, what is it, what they call it, and um, peace negotiator for reconciliation. I work with frontline with many country have civil war now and before. I come from civil war country, Lebanon, and I have very good experience, the woman better than the men in the power. Because if we raise the woman to the power, we are mother. We give birth for our children. We will never send them to the war. We take our decision in the government with our brain, with the heart, sensibly. No woman in the earth will send her children for war to kill them. So we need more training for young women to be everywhere, not in the United Nations or whatever, in their country, especially this country in Africa and Middle East. They are in civil war and they're coming to be in civil war. This is my my um, my suggestion, Caroline. She's very good. We need to send more young women to train in the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do Do you want to to answer to that, Caroline? Uh, no answer. No. I uh, thank you though, uh, and I see there are some here on our screen who are in a war situation right now, actually, huh? So, of course, that is the real, that is the, the hotbed also of the use of this, this Security Council resolution. But, but I would just say that, um, you know, it, it, it's something that we, we should all study a little bit and really try to think even in, in our nations, how we can reach out to our governments to, uh, to yeah, I, I didn't really have a chance to say it, but there is a page on this uh, uh, Security Council resolution uh, website, and also the WILF has a page too, where you can click on your nation, you can click on your flag, and you can see what your government action plan is for these different things for Security Council Resolution 1325, but also for CDAO for, you can find all those things. So I would say for homework, let's tr let's look at these things for our nation with the idea of how we can really help our governments to make better choices and really create that peaceful, better society. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Nida. And uh, well, it's uh, 9.30 now, uh, we should be finishing. We are very thankful. Oh, we have Tatiana who wants to say something. So very uh, last minute comment, Tatiana, or question. I know this resolution for eight years already. Я вважаю, що це зараз взагалі не актуально. 
Uh, I, I, I не розумієте, що, що таке війна. Не actual, розумієте, because... що 24 години нема ніяких прав. Ніяких It's, прав. Uh, Його говорити про те, war що is, моя дитина буде жива, hours, я не говорю про себе як особисто, ніяких прав. Тому що ракети... Максим, Максим, excuse me, can you, can you, can you not speak simultaneously, otherwise we cannot understand you? Yes. Thank you. Go yeah, on, so, Tatiana. Uh, so 24 hours uh, now we have war, so that means that we don't have any rights now. Mm. Now, now what we are doing in Ukraine, we're just talking about freedom. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, while I was preparing this presentation, I thought about Ukraine. Mm. And of course, uh, it's a different time now, time of war. But uh, we expect that soon it will come the time in which you will have to, to rebuild the community and uh, rebuild life together. And that's uh, when this resolution will be helpful then right now it's i mean especially because it's a not it's not a civil confrontation but it's a national international confrontation so it's very difficult to do anything now that's my my humble um comment to what you were saying tatiana can i can i, can I say something okay uh, yeah, hi, Hannah. my name my name is Hannah and I'm a Swedish citizen living in UK. I'm working against domestic violence in uh, in Somali community, especially in Somalian in around the world. And uh, in Somalia, there have been a war above now 30 years. There's no law, but we are doing our best to get up the country, but we have a huge problem when it comes to the women and the children, especially the women and especially the girls. There's almost uh, uh, 700 or 800 women, kids and the children be arrived in Somalia in, a, in almost a two months, three months. So I would love to discuss with you. So if I can get any email from you and go forward with that. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be, uh, would you like to share with her, Caroline? Yes, I can send, put my email. Yeah. I can put my email in the chat right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, if, um, uh, if that's okay with everybody, I cannot see all of you. So I'm sorry if I don't see your hands up. But if it's okay, and if nobody says anything else, we'll be finishing. Oh, Caroline, yes. Well, I only thought because we have so many people who came on this call, <laughs> yes. what, what would be another topic that you would want to hear about? Because we, anyway, we're, we're thinking. That's a good about question. Yeah. Are, are, is there, are there other ideas? Yeah, uh, Marta. Yes, good night. Um, thank you for giving the floor. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, there is a lot of people that they don't know really what is their rights. And we should uh, work on this, first of all. We have to wake them up to understand what's their rights. And in that way, they can be conscious about their rights and then about the freedom. And then we can uh, give them the, the, the way or the, the skills for their fight or, uh, uh, and to get their right back. Otherwise, if we don't, we, we only explain that we have to, yeah, okay, we have these, these uh, uh, agreements and so on. It's not enough. We have to explain to the people that they have rights. These women, they have rights. And this right is for being raised. And then they can de defend themselves or we can help them uh, better. So I think that the next topic 
uh, should be in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly what would be the title? Just the rights of women or what? Women's rights, yes. Women's rights, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Marta. We can even look at the at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a little bit more deeply in terms of relating to women, in fact, uh, something mm -hmm. like that. Yes. I think also, can I just interject? I would like to bring the whole issue about youth, youth have rights as well and youth advocacy. Um, I, I would like to hear a little bit more on that, how the, the United Nations are accommodating youth, youth involvement since you know the future is with the youth and yeah and also the youth also want to know their rights and how they can move forward um yeah i'd be interested in that but also we're going to have another uh meeting like this next week aren't we marcia you're going to introduce that next week next wednesday with uh dr song oh yes oh i'm so sorry uh, well, can you introduce it? I I was so busy preparing myself. So yeah, there, we're going right? to have a, a series of um, um, e e like these evening Wednesday evening meetings. But next next week we're going to introduce a young lady who's who did a, a degree in sociology and she's been studying about rural uh, Korean in the 1960s to the 1970s I, I she gave me a little talk about it and i thought well it's very up to what we're, we're going through going through austerity and hardships you know economical hardships also fuel hardships and things like that and she talked about how the the korean people in the in the rural villages came together and worked together to find a solution and put their resources together in order to cope in a society that is it's, uh, is facing so many difficulties so she will be giving a presentation on that and it's a very interesting she's done a lot of research and I, I felt it's very apt to what we're going through now some nations are going are in recession and are uh, high uh, inflation so and, and she really yes. brought the issue of how women came together and how women played a major role in that mm -hmm. in finding a solution mm -hmm. We so will be sending a post to right meeting, yeah. and yeah. so you can expect to receive that information. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so shall we close here? Um, thank you so much, everyone. I was impressed by the attendance, and I wish to to have seen all of you. <laughs> but anyways. Um, anyhow, thank you again for being there. And uh, Tatiana, we are all praying for Ukraine, praying for your nation, that it comes, that peace comes soon. Mm -hmm. But we are with you in our hearts. And thank you, everyone. So thank you, Caroline, for thank such a, a great thank presentation. Caroline. Yes, thank you, Marcia. And thank you, Caroline. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you, Marcia. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good nice. evening, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.